Well, good morning, good morning. Uh, so good to see everybody today. Uh, I, if nothing else happens today, I was blessed by seeing the little ones and seeing them sing and just lead us in enthusiastic worship. Um, it's beautiful, beautiful. Um, a lot of you folks we've been knowing for years, some of you, never seen you before. But irregardless of that, um, very grateful for the chance to be here today. Uh, so much of today, even though me and my son have been here, you know, maybe three or four times in the last four months, uh, today does feel in my heart of hearts like a homecoming. Uh, so many folks here, they may not even know this, but they are um, in a place in their hearts that feels exactly like family. And we're grateful to God, grateful to your elders today. They took a huge chance letting this old dog hunt today. Uh, I haven't preached but two times in the last year, so if you smell rust, if you see rust, if you hear rust, it's because the dude is rusty. But, but with that said, God is bigger than my rust, and God, uh, I pray, will be honored today and worshiped, and uh, that he'll use these few words uh, that, that I feel like he's given me today uh, to... Uh, not just feed the sheep, but grow the sheep. And so uh, today, if you have your Bibles, I want to give you an invite to turn to Hebrews 13. Today we'll be in Hebrews 13, and we're going to be talking about a subject today that honestly, in a lot of churches, it's, it's not ever talked about. It's not ever discussed. It's not taught. It's really, a lot of times, I believe, not even on the radar of a lot of churches. Now, I know Sovereign Grace is different. Even though I don't know the inner workings of Sovereign Grace, I've heard enough through the grapevine, I've heard enough through the pastors that uh, spiritual authority, the subject we'll speak on today, is probably not a foreign subject. It's probably a subject you have heard about, you have been taught, and you hopefully have already begun to tap in to the, to the blessing of, of, and the grace that God provides through spiritual authority. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to get started. Uh, Hebrews chapter 13, I have just three verses uh, and, and I, do, I normally don't skip, but uh, today the way the sermon is built, I'm going to do uh, Lord willing, verse 7, verse 8, and then verse 17. Those are the three verses. They are loaded. They are absolutely loaded. And I pray that I'm a good steward of the time and uh, faithful to these words that uh, uh, basically the Holy Spirit has spoken. Uh, we don't know the author of Hebrews. So uh, there's, a, there's a range of about six or eight dudes that, that could or could not be. It doesn't matter. The Holy Spirit ultimately is the one who is speaking here, and so we will, we will submit and surrender to that uh, today, uh, beginning with verse 7. If you got your Bibles, I invite you. I'm going to read from the English Standard Version, beginning with verse 7. These are the words of the author. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the Word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, today. And forever. Now skip with me to verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Let's pray. Lord, I, I just I praise you for this day, God. I thank you for the beauty of, of this new day of grace, God. I thank you again for what we just saw, uh, the little ones, God, little boys and girls coming up, and God just uh, showing us the uh, beautiful picture of enthusiastic uh, God worship. God, I thank you that they have had a great three days here, Lord, with the VBS. Lord, I know there's probably a deficit of energy <laughs> right now, as I know they're tired, but God, I thank you that they have enjoyed and received the blessing of these last three days. And God, I pray today, Lord, that uh, as we look at this text, God, that we would, uh, God, whatever our preconceived notions are of spiritual authority, God, I pray, God, that we would give this a fresh look, God, that we would uh, be open, God, that we would not fear spiritual authority in our lives, God, but that we would embrace it, God, knowing it is a wonderful grace, a wonderful blessing that you have provided for your sheep. God, I pray uh, that uh, everything done today, God, from the prayers that have been prayed, the songs that have already been sung, God, from the proclamation of the word, God, that, that it is a beginning in this next few moments, God, the worshipful listening of that word and God, the response, God, I pray it is Absolute surrender and complete worship, God, to your holy grace, God. I, I pray, Lord, your will would be done 
Uh, God, in my heart today, God, because I do believe you work on us as we preach. And God, I pray uh, that you would uh, have your will and your way in all of our hearts, Lord. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you, God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Um, I thought about the best way to start. Uh, I've only preached this sermon one other time in my life, but it's not, it's not even the same sermon. You know, it's hopefully, I hope, more complete. Missing a lot of pieces, had a lot of dysfunction in it. Hopefully God's cleaned it up some, I pray. But one of the things I thought that would be important in speaking on the topic of spiritual authority is to define spiritual authority, which to me was the hardest thing to do. How do I define in good, good terms and good words what spiritual authority is? And so the simple backyard way that God gave me is to look at the words individually, look at the word spiritual, look at the word authority separate, and then put them back together. And so that's what I'm going to try to do. Uh, and and, and I, I went simple. I went elementary school. Uh, I, I looked up a definition simply out of a dictionary for the word spiritual. Uh, the, the, what I found for the word spiritual was that it was relating to or affecting the human soul. Anything that relates to or affects the human soul, that would be something that is spiritual. Uh, then I looked up another definition for the word authority. Authority sound a little bit, a little bit tougher. It says, and this is what I looked up. It says, authority is the power or the right to make decisions, give orders, or enforce obedience. I feel like a spanking's coming. <laughs> right, right, when I read that, I'm like, oh, force obedience. Ew. Well, that, that's, that's what the, the, uh, um, the dictionary said. But I, I got to thinking about obedience, and, and I got to thinking about authority in general. And I personally, I'm a simple person. I have a very visual person. I'm a visual learner. And so for me, when I think about the word authority, I think about the plural of that word, authorities. You hear a lot of times the local authorities, the state authorities, the federal authorities. What does that mean? What is that? What are the authorities? And so, uh, to me, uh, it's, it's, it's government. In my mind, it takes me to this place of government, uh, an authority, whether it be federal, state, or local, city of Prattville, whatever. That would be the governments of those institutions would be authorities, authorities in our life. We think about the authorities that we have. Uh, going all the way back, really, if you go all the way back to the Constitution of the United States, the preamble, the Bill of Rights, that was kind of the, 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 the bedrock in which all of our government was built on in this country. You think about that, you think about the Office of President, Vice President, Congress, House, Senate, all that, and then you come down to the state level, and you pretty much have the same thing, except instead of a president, you have a governor. And then you boil it all the way down to a little town or city like Prattville. You don't have a president. You don't have a governor. You have a mayor. But ultimately, they are uh, layers that actually, if we read Romans 13, they're God-given. They're God-ordained. Now, it, it sometimes seems like it couldn't be. <laughs> when we look at our government, when we look at some decisions that are made across our land and country, we would say, wait a minute, does God have anything at all to do with this? Well, in its origination, in its architecture, in its being given to mankind, it is absolutely God's gift to men. Uh, we may think at times it feels like a curse, but government is something God designed. We didn't invent government. God invented the concept of government. If you read Romans 13, it is for our good. It is to protect, protect and serve, protect and serve the citizen of the city, county, state, country. And so it's, if you could think of government, it, it, God's original design was that it would be a covering. It would be a shield. It would be an umbrella. It would be a protection for the citizen that we would, could, could actually live in peace and, and, and actually not, not chaotic anarchy. And so when I think of government, I, that to me, that, that's where my mind goes when I think of authority. I think about the layers of government. Church is no different. Uh, you may not think about church having its own government, but churches have their own government. Uh, we think of church, we think of, okay, there's 31 flavors of Baskin-Robbins ice cream. Well, that's kind of how church is, that there's way more than 31 flavors. There is uh, denominations. We call them denominations, and, you know, there's a ton of them. I mean, even like I grew up, I was born Baptist. I'm not really Baptist now, but... 
even among the Baptist denomination, there's so many subsections and so many divisions and so many different flavors of the Baptist, it's kind of mind-blowing. And so when we think about government, uh, you may hear this. I know they teach on this in your church. Uh, think of government. Think of the word. You may hear the word. You may hear it called polity, the polity of the church or the government of the church, how it puts together, how it runs, how it functions, how things are get done, how things are done right, correct, and in, in agreement to a confession or to a, a constitution and bylaws, depending on what kind of church it is. So in church, we have these governments, and, and they're all different. Every denomination does it different. Now, I was thinking about this, uh, and I actually talked to Matt about this because I didn't know a whole lot about Sovereign Grace's government. But uh, some, some, some denominations have a centralized arm or centralized arms of their government like for example the Methodists they have three arms they have the council of bishops the general conference and the judicial council these three things working together become their governing authority and they're not really uh, most Methodist churches are not autonomous they actually will answer to those higher arms of authority uh, same as the Presbyterians the churches of the sessions a group of them make up Presbyterians. A group of Presbyterians make up, I don't even know if I'm saying this word right, synods, synods. And then all those together go under this, this umbrella called the General Assembly. Well, if you're talking about a Methodist or you're talking about a Presbyterian, these arms or these organizations really do um, give out a lot of governance on the local church. If you're a church like a Baptist church or a Southern Baptist church or, or even Sovereign Grace, um, uh, for example, Sovereign Grace, well, the Southern Baptists have the, the, uh, the Southern Baptist Convention, the North American Mission Board, the Alabama Baptist Association, the Alabama State Board of Missions, your local county associations. That's Baptist. You guys, from what I understand, have these two things that are kind of your, your great aid in, in being a church, being a local church. You have the Assembly of Elders and the Council of Elders. And, and you still get to be Sovereign Grace. You still get to be your... your oh, oh, almost your own sovereign, independent church, your local expression, but at the same time you have this great right hand and this great left hand of these two groups of elders that come in and provide training, come in and maybe if there's doctrinal issues, they iron them out, you know, they work them out. If there's ever a reason, God forbid, but if there's ever a reason for church discipline among the actual elders, they would get involved. But for the most part, Sovereign Grace Prattville can be Sovereign Grace Prattville. You don't have to run every little decision up the chain. But some churches, you have to run all the decisions up the chain. That's enough on that. <laughs> but I want you to understand, government can be not just in our country and in our city and our state. It can be in our churches. And the, the design is for our covering, for our protection, for our spiritual nourishment, for our um, actually, just, just our spiritual health and, and, and actually being able to grow in Christ. These things are useful tools uh, that we need not discount, is, is not important. And so we go, we go to Scripture, and, and if you think about the Scripture, think about just what you know, your general knowledge of the Bible. Uh, the Scriptures, the Holy Scriptures, are our, are our bedrock. They're our cornerstone for everything we believe, for everything for, regarding to your faith, or the practice of your faith should come from Holy Scripture. This is the absolute source of truth, the Word of God. And so what we believe and how we believe in the outer working of our faith comes from Scripture. So if you think about that, then you look at Old Testament, you think, okay, well, what was spiritual authority in the Old Testament? Spiritual authority was really even before the church was a church. You had these guys called patriarchs. You had Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, who would begin to be the front runners or the forefathers of God's people. Eventually, you'd have these things called priests, and you'd have these guys called prophets, and they really were all together in their own different way parts of the spiritual authority that people in the Old Testament experienced, and, and that was their spiritual authority at that time. We get New Testament, and you still have priests, but then you have, obviously, everything changes when Jesus comes, and a lot of that traditional stuff, even though it wants to hold on with the death grip, God institutes, through Christ, the institution of the church we see in Acts, and it is actually built on these guys, these new group of guys called apostles. You, know, you think about apostles, you think of Peter, you think of Paul, you think of James, you think of Apollos, you think of these sort of guys, and they become the spiritual authority of that day. So, uh, Old Testament, 
patriarchs, priests, prophets, New Testament, really apostles. The apostles, is, it was, was the, what uh, the Lord built, built the church on. And so, and today, we have elders. We have uh, apostles, little a, if that makes any sense. Uh, we don't have a legitimate apostles today that can write scripture, that can add to the word of God. But we do have little a apostles, I believe, that are their heart's church planting. Their heart is growing the kingdom of God. Their, their heart is working in comp, uh, um, conjunction and in partnership with other bodies to, to expand uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ, to expand the footprint, to expand the name and the glory of God. And so today we have uh, elders. And, and you guys, you don't know this. You probably, well, maybe you do if you've been in a lot of churches. A lot of churches got one guy. They got one guy. And he is the, usually he's called a senior pastor. He is the elder, the lone elder. And he's doing it all by himself. He may have some deacons that help him, but he's the lone spiritual authority. In Sovereign Grace, you are so blessed. You have a team of three pastors. A lot of churches do not have that. Have never had that. A lot of churches have never had that. And so you have a special gift, a special grace that God has blessed this place with, in that you have a team of pastors. You have a spreading of that spiritual authority, so much so that they actually have, the pastors actually have spiritual authority in their own life. They have each other. Uh, the, 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 the bummer of the thing is when you're a, a lone ranger solo pastor, you've got your sheep, you've got your, your deacons, there's nobody for you. <laughs> and yeah, you could go team up with some guys at the other church, but it's not the same. But if they're in your church and you've got a brotherhood of pastors, then man, they're sharpening in all directions. There's accountability in all directions. And not only that, there is a pastoral care. I don't care how great the pastor is. He needs it. He needs it. He's going to die without it. <laughs> he will. He needs it. And so you guys are so blessed here at Sovereign Grace. You've got a team of three pastors. And, and if I know the hearts of the leaders the way I think I do, they're going to grow more. They're going to grow more. I know that Pastor Matt, he may not talk about this much, but I know, I know from the past, someday, he's like, let's plan another one. Let's plan another one. You know, this was number one. But where's number two? Number three? We don't know when that'll happen, but that's the heart of a pastor. And so if you've got help and you've got a, a, a team, those things become possible. Lone Ranger stuff, it's not going to really be possible to do that. So anyway, let's get to the scriptures that I actually read. <laughs> uh, verse number 7 of chapter 13 says, Remember your leaders, those who spoke, spoke the word of God to you. Um, let's just stop right there for a second. Uh, when I first studied this, I thought this was a general statement. I thought this was, and I do believe, don't get me wrong, I do believe this is to all peoples from all times for the church in the future from this point. This is, this is good godly counsel from the word but what i didn't know when i studied this is the author was specifically talking primarily to one actual group of of, of leaders he said remember your leaders that spoke it didn't say are speaking or, or or will speak it says who spoke the word of god to you past tits and doing a little bit of studying and really leaning on my man rc Sproul, which I, I don't know how much y'all know about him i know a lot of you do um, what I learned was the church was really in a unique point in place. The context of this letter is the church is at a point where it is shifting gears. A torch is being handed from that first generation, that first wave of apostles, the Pauls, the Peters, the Jameses, the Apollos, uh, all those guys that we read about, the torch is being passed with them, from them to the new generation of leaders and as, as we've looked further and as I've read more, more from commentaries and just historians and Bible scholars, you know, we don't do good with change. We never do good with change. And the older we get, even the worse, we, we stink at change. And even at this time, even though it's passing on, the torch is being passed, some people are stiff to that. Some people are not open-minded or open-hearted. And so um, what I learned in my study of this is he, he, he primarily is talking to a specific group, that first century, that first generation, that first wave of apostles. He said, remember these guys. Remember how they spoke, past tense, the word of God to you. Their time is, is to an end, but they're going to be replaced. And we need not fret about that. And that's really, I think, what verse 8 is more about than anything. It says, remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God. Oh, uh, if you have legitimate spiritual authority in your life, 
and I absolutely believe you do with the men that I think I know at your church, that's going to be the thing you hear most coming out of their mouth. Not their opinion, not their preference, not their, their own contrived ideas, but they will speak the Word of God. What makes spiritual authority a, a, a legitimate, what makes it actually true and effective for your life is when it actually the word of god is the bedrock the word of god is the cornerstone when your elders speak they speak the word of god and if they do that now and you say well yeah they do well i'll just say you need to know that you know and you won't know if you don't know the word so you need to know the word to know that they're speaking the word of god and that you check their oil you need to do that and so but if if a legitimate spiritual authority is speaking the word of god that's a really good sign. That's a really good start. But that's only half the equation. The second half, it says to consider the outcome of their way of life. Consider the outcome of their way of life. We have a lot of people under spiritual authority today, and they're under the wrong authority. You say, why? Because they're under false teachers. And you say, well, why are they false teachers, Scott? Usually you think doctrine. Well, they're, just te- they're not teaching the Word. They're teaching some other junk that's not biblical. It's not faithful to Scripture. But that's just half of being a false teacher. There's another false teacher that we don't think about as much. We think about bad doctrine. We think about bad teaching. But on this other hand, it's well, they, they, their, their teaching seems to be congruent, seems to be correct. Their life just is nowhere near what they're saying. In other words, they don't practice what they preach. They don't live the Word. They talk about the Word, but they don't live it. So that's the thing, you know, for spiritual authority. Your spiritual authority needs to know the Word, speak the Word, depend on the Word, but then when you look at their life, you need to see it together. You need to see them lining up. And so, uh, so many spiritual authorities, so-called spiritual authorities today, one of those pieces of myth, either they're teaching crazy doctrine that's absolutely not congruent with the Word or the heart of God, or their, t- their teaching's okay. They're just living like, like they don't even know what they're saying, like they don't even know what they're see, uh, teaching. So you have to know. You have to be able to see that. And you know what? The only way you're going to see that, and we're going to get to this at the very end, the biggest reason why spiritual authority doesn't happen in churches is because people are afraid of people. You are afraid of spiritual authority, and sometimes spiritual authority is afraid of you. (laughs) We are. We are. I'm telling you, people are scary. And we're going to talk about a big door in a little bit. But that's the biggest reason why spiritual authority doesn't happen. There's this fear. It's either ignorance or it's, no, no, I know. I just don't want nothing to do with it because I don't want them to know me. Biggest part of this is knowing each other. you got to know your pastors. you got to be in their life. And they got to be in your life. If they're not, you're just pretending to have spiritual authority. You don't really have it. And, so, and, and that involves a whole lot of stuff. It's not always fun or easy or clean. But, but it's, a ne- it's a necessity for us to, 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 to move forward and to grow in Christ. So, verse 7 says, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of the way of their life. Now, when I think about that, thinking back about the original audience, thinking about the original uh, spiritual authority that he's talking to, the leaders that he's talking about, that first wave of apostles, I think of, I think of these words. I, I wanted to read this to you. And it's not fancy. It's not higher. It's not great literary I mean, it's not it's not fancy talk but in second timothy 4 7 paul says these simple words i fought the f- good i fought the good fight i have finished the race i have kept the faith and if you read the next verse he's like and and, and I'm, I'm i'm anxious i'm excited about getting my my crown of glory that he would be rewarded with a crown uh, at the end of that and then he goes on to say and, and all who have anticipated who have desired the coming of the lord They'll receive the same. So when it says, consider the outcome of the way of their life, you say, what what does that mean, Scott? Did they finish strong? Did they finish well? Did they, as Paul said, did they fight the good fight? Did they finish the race? Did they keep the faith? And and we know from what we study, you know, with the whole counsel of God's Word, what we do know is that this first century group of leaders, that first generation, uh, they weren't perfect. I mean, you, you, th- you can find something wrong with every one of them. You can. And you say, God picked that guy? God picked that guy? He loves picking people we would never pick. That's, that's exactly what he loves to do because he gets the glory that way. And so what happened is these guys, they finished strong, they finished well. 
And, and their lives lined up with what they were preaching and teaching. They weren't false teachers. They, had, they proclaimed the word and they lived the word. And, and that's so important. That's so important. They have to have, it has to be a good marriage of pro proclamation and, and walking the walk. Walking in a manner worthy of the calling. So <clears throat> we, we see here in uh, verse 7, the very last part of it says, And imitate their faith. Uh, the one thing I would say about this first century, first generation of leaders was, if you could just say one word without getting all fancy, it's just they were faithful. They were faithful. The thing that we need to imitate is their faithfulness, not their style. I mean, we have people we look up to today. We have people, I mean, giants of the faith that are alive today. Uh, especially in the reform circles, there's guys I just I love. I just, it's almost like they're rock stars, and I'm the, I'm an idol worshiper. But truthfully, those guys are flawed, just like the guys, just like the apostles were flawed. But all in all, by and large, imperfections and all, they were faithful. They are faithful. And so, um, you know, will they fall? Will they fail? Will they stumble? Yeah. They, the, the apostles did. But God gave them the heart of repentance. They knew how to repent when they fell. And they knew how to pick that cross back up and say, I ain't stopping. I am not stopping. So help me God, I'm going to walk. I'm walking this path. And the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. You know? And so we, we see this, this, this call to imitate those type people, those type leaders. We can imitate the first century apostles, the first uh, generation of leaders. But all those that have followed... See, they didn't have a big report card at this point. It was just one generation. Well, look at how many generations we've had of faithful men from that point till now. We've got a whole lot more guys to look up to. We have a whole lot more people to imitate that truly were faithful, that truly, I mean, was, was instrumental in building the kingdom of God through their faithfulness, through their humility, through their love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so... We have to know that we are called to imitate these, these, these people, these leaders. And then it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. I really struggled with this verse. I mean, not, not that, it did, that I didn't know what it meant. It's a simple verse. I just I said, God, why don't you stick it right here? This doesn't make any sense. I mean, it's right here. It's, it's kind of in a weird place. It's just because I didn't know any better. But in the context of what's going on this time, remember the torch being passed? going from the leaders of yesterday to the leaders of tomorrow and the people being a little resistant because they didn't like change. We don't know this guy. <laughs> we don't know these new guys. But we see here that I believe the author calls them to remember who's in charge, who is sovereign, who is in control, and who never changes. Who is, who is our immutable God? Who is our immutable God? Who is? Who is I mean, truthfully, the, the leaders can change. But the power that called those first leaders, the ones that followed them, the ones that replaced them, the same God's going to call and equip them. That doesn't change. The mission, uh, the purpose of the church does not change. The power of the gospel does not change. The goal to evangelize, to fulfill the Great Commission, that does not change. And so I believe the author here is, is trying to comfort, hey, you can worry about things that are changing, and we always do. He's still in control. He's still God. And, and you know what? He got maximum. He got maximum utility. I'll use that word. It's a terrible word. But he got maximum utility out of those first apostles. He could, he could get more. He will get even more out of the ones that follow. Chill out. Relax. The God that was the God of yesterday and the God of today and the God of tomorrow is the same God. He changes not. And so for that, we could take comfort. Uh, someday, you know, I don't know how long sovereign grace, you know, grace will last, but I, I do know this. Uh, I pray till the Lord comes back. Uh, but someday I believe there will be a second campus. And you know what? There'll be some probably some need for some new leaders. And, and you know, we don't need to resist that. We don't need to be worried about that uh, because he's in charge, you know. He's in charge. Oh, same God that, that architected that first church born out of Acts is the same God doing what he's doing today in us and in you and through you in the churches that are, you know, that are faithful to him. And so um, I'm going to go to the very next verse, uh, which is 17. And, and 17 sounds so much like 7. They're similar. They're very similar verses. 
but they're a little bit different. <laughs> a little bit different. Uh, verse 7 says this. Remember, consider, imitate. Think about that. If that was your job, remember, consider, imitate. That doesn't sound too terrible. This next one, though, says obey and submit. That's a little bit harder. That's a little bit, that's cutting a little bit deeper into my flesh. I guarantee you it is. Uh, he says, uh, verse 17, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they're keeping watch over your souls. Obey your leaders and submit to them. Uh, that's a hard thing for our flesh. I've been in ministry since I'm 19. I'd love to tell you I'm a perfect example of submission. I'm not. I've blown it. I've blown it. And there's a few guys in here. There's a few guys. You know who you are. I don't want to point you out. But you've seen me be very resistant to submitting to spiritual authority when it went against what I thought was best. The problem is, so much of the time we fail to realize that God-given, God-ordained spiritual authority is not just submitting to the men, but the God in those men big difference in the way you think about it and and obviously i've had wrong thinking in my in my past uh, especially right, right around 2014-15 uh my heart was convinced that this is what i needed to do you know and i'm older than wiser than the guys that were calling me to submit but i needed them and i didn't know how much i needed them i did not realize that um Submitting to the man is submitting to the God in the man, too. It's, as unto the Lord, it's not just submitting to leaders. It's submitting to the God of those leaders. And it's one and the same. And so we have to be careful that we don't get too haughty. Um, sin of my past is just pride. Just pride. It, and you're not immune to it. Someday some pastor is going to challenge you. Maybe one of these in this church, you'll be like, you know, I think I know what's better for my life than that rascal. You know, he doesn't live in my house. He doesn't wear my clothes. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit lives in that man. Uh, and and, and that's, that's, that's a different level. Uh, I mean, that's a different game. And so, so we, we have to be careful when we think about submission, who we're really submitting to. Uh, just like government was instituted for the good of nation and country and people and to protect and serve, spiritual authority was good for the sheep of God, the family of God, the people of God for their love, their nourishment. Without spiritual authority, truthfully, you will be stunted in your growth. Without spiritual authority, you will be uh, not just stunted in your growth. You'll, you'll, you'll always have a piece of immaturity that could be, I guess, weaned out of you if you really learned the heart of submission. And, I, and, and I'm not saying I've learned the heart of submission. I've got a lot to learn. We all do. We really all do. It says, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls. Just to talk a second about keeping watch over your souls, I have two souls, I have two word pictures for you. One is simple for our agrarian people, our people who love animals. I'll use this one. Imagine a big field, a big, lush, green field. The field is beautiful. It's the dew-soaked grass. It's real green. Imagine about 300 sheep out there. Imagine the shepherd out there with his hook and his sandals, and he's out there, and he's like, He's, he's just counting. He's watching. Okay, are they all here? Are they all here? Oh, wait a minute. Hey, guys, no, no, guys, come here. No, no, that, that field's off limits. That stuff's got some bad grass. You're going to have some tummy problems if you eat that junk. And, and, or, or, oh, hey, I know that wood line there. It's always a stinking wolf over there. Hey, sheep, come back this way. Sheep, I need you to come back. I need you to come back. He can drive himself crazy, but imagine that shepherd keeping the sheep together, keeping the sheep safe, Keeping the sheep from turning on each other, that happens. Shockingly enough, the sheep like to bite each other. They like to push each other off and push each other in the hole. No, I want the good grass. You get out of my way, you know. He has to keep them together, keep them as one unit. He has to also be looking out for the wolves, for the coyotes, for the rattlesnakes, for those treacherous cliffs where they'll fall and break an ankle, uh, break, a, break a leg. And so imagine that sheep-shepherd relationship uh, that is a picture of standing guard over your soul. Uh, he, the sheep are distracted. Why? They're just munching down. And they're, ah, I'm going I'm to get, have you, have you ever fed, like, and this is not part of the sermon, this is Scott being Scott. Have you ever fed a group of three or more dogs? They fight over the food. Sheep could do that too. <laughs> and so the shepherd has to keep them in one accord, in unity, keep them from killing each other, killing themselves, doing stupid stuff. 
it's a very, it requires his full attention, his full eyes and ears to see all the damage. Now, forget that. That's one image. Now go to this side. Y'all did a keeper of the kingdom thing, and I, I was thinking about it when they were showing their pictures on the video. Imagine a castle. I like to watch a lot of old stuff, old medieval type shows, you know, gladiator type, you know, good butt kicking stuff, you know, good, good action movies from the past. And I, in my mind, I imagine a castle with four corners and each corner has a watchtower In each of those towers is a watchman. That's your elder. That's your pastor. And he's really looking two directions. You think he's just looking out to see if there's an enemy attack. He's also looking back on the inside of the wall. Are they behaving? Are they behaving? Are they loving each other? Okay, I got to look for the wolf. I got to look for the enemy. First Peter tells us Satan is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may de devour. He's looking. That, that, that watchman, that, 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 that elder on the tower on the corner, he's looking for that Ephesians 6 spiritual warfare. He's looking for that. He's watching for it as best as he can. The great thing is imagine four corners of a castle and you just got one watch guy. You just got one guy, and then he's on one corner. Man, sneak attacks, backdoor stuff. Imagine if you got a guy on each corner. It's going to be hard to get caught by surprise. So more is, more is better. Thank the Lord that you have three pastors here with more to come, with more to come. And, and that is so important for your protection, for you being able to be covered by that level of spiritual authority to where you can actually... Even against your own, you know, I think it's Acts 18. I think it was Paul says, hey, worry about the enemy within, not just the enemy on the outside. There's enemies from both ways. And sometimes we become the enemy and we don't even realize it. The spiritual authority, the elder, he's got to keep his eye on all that stuff. And so it's a big job. I think about big jobs. I think about heart surgeons. I think about brain surgeons. I think about the guy that builds the rocket that goes up to, you know, somewhere on some other planet. I think about even the big jobs of leaders of our government. But you know the difference in the job that a pastor has? Everything he's doing, if he's doing it right, is all eternal. It's all eternal. It's not temporary. All these other jobs, they get paid the billions of dollars, and it's so important it's just temporary stuff. It's not going to really impact eternity. But the work of the pastor, the work of that spiritual authority in your life, it's eternal. It's so important. So that leads me to this. Oh, before I get to that, um, well, let me go ahead and I'll skip and I'll go backwards. It says, let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. If the guy's on the watchtower or the shepherd is in the field walking with a sheep trying to keep them together, and all they do is fuss and fight. And all they do is complain. Hey, did you, you got to take us to this field again? We want to go to this other field, you know. Or you're screaming at the top of your lungs. The enemy's coming. The enemy's coming. They're like, yeah, right, whatever. He doesn't know what he's talking about. You don't listen. <laughs> the shepherd can lose his ever-loving mind. He can go crazy trying to get the sheep to listen. And so um, we need to make sure we don't make his job harder than it should be. It's already the hardest job on the earth, I believe. It's the easiest job to screw up, too. It's the easiest job to get lazy on and say, you know what? <sighs> that sheep, I just, I, I just can't look. I, I got to ignore it. I got to walk away. The sheep's driving me nuts. It's easy to do that. It's easy to get that attitude. Just get so discouraged, so beat down, uh, so downtrodden in your spirit as a, as a minister that what happens is, You've lost your effectiveness to cover those sheep, to guard those sheep, to be their spiritual authority because the whining and complaining, and yes, that is one of my gifts, whining and complaining. So, And there's a guy, I'm waiting on him to say amen. He had not said it yet. Uh, he's, he's saying it inside, though. I know he is. Um, the whining and complaining of the sheep, the sheep biting each other, and then the sheep deciding to bite him because sometimes even the pastor gets bit. Hey, I'm the shepherd. Oh, he just took a plug out of my knee, you know. It happens in church. And so, what the scriptures say right here, let them do this with joy, not with groaning, for that being no advantage to you. I'll go ahead. I would never change God's word. That would be no advantage to anybody. No, nobody. The pastor, the, uh, anybody. It, it, it is a terrible disadvantage to have a downtrodden pastor. The hardest job in the world, and, and we go and make it tougher on him. Uh, that's just that's, that's nuts. We can't do that. What I want you to think about 
Oh, this is really the point I wanted to get to. To me, this is the most important thing I'll say today about spiritual authority. If you can imagine spiritual authority in your life, right now for this church, for this time, it's three pastors. If you can imagine spiritual authority as a door, a big door, a big door with a door handle and a lock, and on the outside of the door stands the pastors, in this case, three pastors, and they approach the door. On the inside of the door, behind the lock, is the sheep. Maybe one of you, maybe someone who's not even here today, but there's this door in every one of our lives where from this direction, the outside are the pastors, on the inside are the sheep. The door is a door of opportunity. The door is a door of God's grace and God's blessing. If it is opened, <laughs> if it's open, if it's never opened, it does, it, it, it's nothing. And so if you can think of spiritual authority in your life as it, from a sheep perspective, going to that door, Unlocking the door and open it and welcoming that pastor into your life. You say, yeah, but they'll get to know me and that might stink. He can't cover you any other way. He has to know. And, and, and you know what? You'll get to know him. And you'll get to find out he's just about as imperfect as you are. You know? <laughs> and so this is a beautiful relationship that has to happen to really have legitimate spiritual authority. You've got to open the door. And pastors, you cannot be weenies. You cannot be chicken. You can't look at that door like, I know what's behind that door. I just want to go home. I'm so tired. And, you know, the last time I went through one of those doors, I got, whoa, I got bit, you know. You got to go through the door, brothers. Uh, the pastors that are here um, can't shy away from it. Now, I do say this. You need to be prayed up. You need to be prayed up. You need to have the armor of God on you. And you need to first pray that they'll open the darn door. Open the door. But then when they open it, you'd be man enough to walk in and love the heck out of them, no matter what they are, no matter what they say, no matter what they show you as sheep. The shepherd has to go in and just love them and eat them up. And he may get bit in the process. He needs to know that. And that's just, that's just how it is. But spiritual authority, view it as a door that God has placed in every one of your lives. If you're in Christ, if you're not in Christ, you probably would never even know the door is there. But in Christ, you have to know the doors there. Now, it's just up to you if you're going to open it. And it's up to the pastor, like, okay, I'm going to approach the door and I'm going to knock. And, you know, have you, ever, have you ever went to somebody's house where are passing out flyers and like, I really don't want to be here. And then you take off running. It can't be that kind of knock. you got to stay. you got to sit there and stay. And you've got to keep knocking. And you've got to say, Lord, please let them open the door. Please let them open. you got to actually want them to open the door. And when they do open the door then you step in that door and you grab them and you love them uh, figuratively, you know, in Christ. You love them because of the power of agape love in you, God-powered love that God has put in you. You love them, and guess what? You'll both learn. You both need God more than you ever knew. <laughs> and you'll, you'll keep learning that same lesson. You won't ever stop learning. Gosh, I thought I needed God this much. That ain't close to what I needed God. I needed him so much more, and they needed him so much more. And so if you can think of the door of opportunity... It has to be approached from both sides. There's a great call to a pastor. He can't be a weenie. He can't be a coward. And the sheep, you got to open the darn door. You got to open the door. Let 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 the man, let the the, the, the elders into your into your life, and let them know you. Oh, I had a pastor once a long time ago. He was giving me advice. I was a young youth pastor. He says, Scott, the mistake you're making is you're getting too close to the people. You're a shepherd, and they're the sheep, and you've got to keep them a safe distance away. Well, I, I, I disagreed with him, but I didn't really know why I disagreed with him. Now I just think that's the dumbest thing he ever said. You know, <laughs> I do, because we have to know each other. We have to be in each other's lives. We have to walk with Jesus and walk together. Otherwise, I can't see. I'm not even on that watchtower corner. I'm not even holding the shepherd's staff if I don't know you. Your pastor's... They can't give you spiritual authority. They can't give you that covering, that oversight. They can't even warn you the enemy because they don't even know you. You're a stranger. You say, well, I see him every Sunday. That's not good enough. <laughs> so many people have the wrong idea that the pastor, yes, he speaks the word of God. I receive the word of God in Sunday sermon. You know when you really start to grow? When you receive the word of God where you live from that pastor. That he can speak words of truth and life on your front porch, in your living room, in your backyard next to the barbecue grill, he can feed you the Word of God, and it's not just the context of a gathered... I mean, you can receive so much here, but there's more. There's more. Otherwise, you'll really know him, and he'll never really know you. 
And like I said, you have three. You have three guys that can approach the door. And, and they won't all be gifted the same. They won't want to be a good talker, want to be shy, want to be in the middle of those two. And you just, you take the best from all and you submit. Oh, hardest thing to do is submit. It says right here, obey your leaders and submit. <laughs> is there not a better way, God? No, there's not. He knows best. And so we have to learn to submit to, to uh, the, the leadership that God has instituted. Uh, if I look over at uh, Romans 13... Uh, which is really talking more about government. But I think the principle applies. I just want to read this to you real quick. I believe that this is, this, is, this is very similar for spiritual authority. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God that those, than those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities, resists the God, resists what God has appointed and those who resist will incur judgment. Now, this is talking about government, government of the land. But, you know, it, I, I believe it's the same result. We resist the spiritual authority that God's put in our life. Uh, then we're actually resisting God. And in that, there will be a price to pay. There will be a judgment against us. And so, don't be your own worst enemy. <laughs> we, we can be that so much of the time. I think I have one last thing to ask you. Um, I think this is it. Um, you have a great setup here at uh, Sovereign Grace. You have a team of pastors, and I actually know all three of them. I know two of them a lot better than I know one of them, but I believe that you have a great, beautiful open door, or, or a door. that it, it, it could be closed for some of you. It could be open for others, but you have a perfect recipe here to really have healthy, life-giving, blessing spiritual authority here at this church. But just to have the opportunity of something doesn't mean you're necessarily going to utilize it. The question I would leave with you today is, do you, do you, have, do you believe you have spiritual authority in your life? Is there a, a spirit of submission that you have submitted to your elders? Do you have that? Or is it just an idea that someday you'll get around to because your, your growth is going to be stunted. You're, um, you're not going to be as covered or protected. Uh, and then for the pastors, I, I have to do this. I love them. But they got to go after the door. They got to go to that door. And they have to be intentional and they have to be aggressive. The bad thing about being a pastor, you can wait on the sheep to make the first move. A lot of times you'll be waiting forever. <laughs> you guys, you got to go. You got to go. It's on you. It's on you. It's on you. It's on the pastors. We have to pursue the sheep because the sheep, man, they're, they're doing their thing. And sometimes we get the great blessing of a sheep that opens the door even before we got there and says, hey, pastor, would you come over to my house? i got something I want to talk to you about. That don't always happen. That's more of the exception than the rule. Usually the rule is the pastor, you got to hunt them down. you got to hunt them down in love and say, hey, I want to get in your life. I want to be that watchman on that tower. I want to be that guy with that shepherd's staff that when the snake comes, I can crush his head and, 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 and keep you safe, to keep you guarded, to keep you protected in Christ. And so that, that's pretty much all I have today. I thank y'all for your uh, great attention. Uh, do you have spiritual authority? Do you want spiritual authority? Usually the two reasons we wouldn't want spiritual authority, oh, I don't want to be known. I don't want to be known in that way. I don't want him to know me that well because he'll see the flaws. That's okay. He's probably as bad as you are. And number two, <laughs> the other reason we don't want spiritual authority is, well, we like being in control. We like to be the boss. Well, I got this great plan. It's got to be good. I don't need these guys' approval. I, I I, can, I got perfect vision of what I need to do. No, you don't. I've learned blind spots, they're everywhere. You need the brothers. You need the brethren. You need pastoral oversight in your life. You need to. You need it. Otherwise, stepping in potholes and pitfalls and doing a lot of harm even to yourself and you don't know it. That's all I got. Let's pray. God, I thank you and I praise you for this day. God, I thank you that you have... God, provided as a grace, God, as a tremendous blessing to your sheep, this idea and concept and reality, God, reality of, of uh, spiritual authority. God, here in this church, God, they are so blessed to have three pastors that love and serve you, God, that want to love and serve them as well, to be that protection, to be that covering, to be that shepherd with that staff, to be that... Watchmen on that tower, God, that guides and guards their heart. God, the part that I forgot, <laughs> I 
I always forget something, Lord. But that, that verse 17, that part that I didn't preach, that I should have preached, says that those men give an account. They have to give an account. God, we as men will give an account of how well we loved, how much, how well we led our wives and our children. But God, for those pastors, there's another level of accountability. That is how well they loved and led their sheep. God, how well they stayed and endured the grueling task of standing on that watchtower or carrying that shepherd's hook and walking through those fields with those sheep to keep them together, to keep them safe. God, the accountability, Lord, is so high. And God, they will give an account to you, Lord. Help the sheep see that, Lord. It's not just some fun, easy, going to the beach job. It is tough. It is man's work, God, that you have ordained and that you've called us uh, to be a, a part of, Lord, as ministers. God, I pray, Lord Jesus, that, um, God, when we do give an account, God, we can, in honor and integrity, say we love the sheep well. We guarded the sheep as best we could. We walked with them through valleys and through high places. We stood on that tower corner, Lord. We warned of the enemy from outside, and we warned from the enemy, uh, warned against the enemy on the inside. God, when we needed to step in, even if it meant we were going to bleed a little, God, we were faithful. God, I pray that's our prayer. Ultimately, what Paul said at the end, <laughs> I fought the good fight. I finished the race. Um, God, I pray that um, that's us, Lord, that, that, that's your men. Lord, I thank you and I praise you for these, these folks at this sweet church. I pray your richest blessing on them. I pray, God, they would no longer, if they have been afraid of spiritual authority, God, they would they let the wall down and open the door and receive their pastors, Lord, with joy. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.